The Lord Jehovah is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name put their trust in you, for you, O Lord Jehovah, have never forsaken those who seek you. In these words from Psalm 9, David memorialized how God had protected him in the past. Firstly, as a young shepherd, then against the giant Goliath, and on through the years as a young soldier in King Saul's army. Then in exile, with the king's hand turned against him, and finally for the many years when as king, he shepherded Israel for God. By his writings, this warrior poet of 3,000 years ago calls us to put our trust in God and to know, not just believe, but know that God is never far from those who seek him above all else. In this message, we will look at the danger that awaits anyone who places their trust anywhere but in God. My name is Edward Brown, and I serve the Almighty Lord God as the shepherd of the Potchefstroom Methodist Church. Let us pray. O oh, praise to your name, Almighty Lord God. Praise you, for you are the one who protects and blesses all who put their trust in you and follow you. Your servant David extolled you as the Good Shepherd, Jehovah Rohi, the God who looks after his people. We praise you as the one who shepherds us through our daily lives and has led us safely past enemies and troubles that we never knew about. We praise you and we thank you because we know that you will continue to lead and guide all who put their trust in you. Lord Jesus Christ, you who are the Son of God, we praise you because you called yourself the Good Shepherd. You are the Shepherd who laid down your life to deliver us from the power of the consequences of sin. Just as your ancestor David stood between his flock of sheep and wild beasts, so you stood between us and the evil one who hates us because we are part of your flock. O Lord Jesus, beloved shepherd and master, please continue to lead us past all the temptations and every physical danger here on earth until the day when you lead us through the gates of the new Jerusalem and into the eternal kingdom of your blessed Heavenly Father. Most Holy Spirit, we bless your name. For by your power you enable the prophets and kings of old to shepherd your people, and you continue to do so even today through the ministers and pastors that have been called to serve the Heavenly Father in Jesus' name. At this time, we pray your guidance and protection on those who are your under-shepherds throughout the Church Universal. May they be faithful to the Lord Jesus, the Great Shepherd, and lead his sheep to where you may supply them with the spiritual food that will enable them to grow into the image of our Lord Jesus. For we pray these things to God's glory, and we join in the prayer that the Lord Jesus gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The hymn that I have chosen for today is by the Scottish preacher and hymn writer, Reverend Horatius Bonner. It is, I heard the voice of Jesus say, and is number 154 in the Methodist hymnal. I heard the voice of Jesus say, Come unto me and rest. Lay down, thou weary one, lay down, thy head upon my breast. I came to Jesus as I was, weary and worn and sad. I found in him a resting place, and he has made me glad. I heard the voice of Jesus say, Behold, I freely give. The living water, thirsty one, stoop down and drink and live. I came to Jesus and I drank of that life-giving stream. 
My thirst was quenched, my soul revived, and now I live in him. I heard the voice of Jesus say, I am this dark world's light. Look unto me, thy morn shall rise and all thy day be bright. I looked to Jesus and I found in him my star, my sun. And in that light of life I walk till travelling days are done. The lessons for today are to be found in the Old Testament, firstly in the book of Exodus, chapter 20, and we read from verse 1. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath. Or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. But showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. For the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. And therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The next lesson is taken from the New Testament, the first letter of John, and it is the closing verses of chapter 5. We read together. From verse 18, we know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who is born of God keeps him safe, and the evil one cannot harm him. We know we are children of God, and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. We also know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding, that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. May God bless these lessons to our understanding. The title of today's message is Worship God Alone. False gods will surely fail you. I remember once seeing a three-panel cartoon strip. In the first panel, a boy was standing on the porch of a house, and in the open door stood the mother of the home. The boy asked the mother if, Can Johnny come out and play? No, said the mother in panel number two. He's busy worshipping. 
Panel 3 then revealed Johnny sitting cross-legged in the lounge, deeply engrossed in his favourite TV programme. The point our cartoonist wished to make was easily understood. Idolatry has many forms. When we think about idols, we tend to automatically think of fanciful statues of people or animals. The golden calf that Aaron made for the rebellious Israelites as recorded in Exodus 32. Then there is the bronze snake on a pole that Moses crafted to combat snake bite, which the Jews worshipped as Nehushtan. You can read about that in 2 Kings chapter 18 verse 4. And of course the most famous of all, the 27 meter high golden statue of Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 3. These are just some examples culled from three different periods in the Old Testament Jewish histories. But idols come in many forms and shapes. They may be external physical objects or internal ideas. There are people who idolize sportsmen and women, pop musicians, film stars, and even politicians. There are folk for whom their sports, their hobbies, their TV shows, alcohol or drugs are the idols. In fact, idols come in an infinite variety of shapes, sizes, and concepts. The question is, how do we identify an idol? The answer is that, like the boy watching the TV program, an idol can be anything that becomes more important to us than God is. The terrible truth about such idols, such false gods, is that when we need them, they always fail. When natural disasters strike, or when a serious illness attacks a loved one, then the impotency of these false gods is exposed. In Judges chapter 6, we find the story that makes this point. Because the Jewish people had begun to worship other gods, the Lord God said, Fine, worship those gods, but know that you are on your own from now onwards. And soon they were being exploited and attacked by their powerful Midianite neighbors who raided them and stole their crops. Who, by the way, were also descendants of Abraham by his second wife Keturah. You can read about that in Genesis 25. Now, after about seven years of this, God appeared to a young man by the name of Gideon and commissioned him to lead the Israelites. Gideon's first task was to remove his father's idols of the Canaanite fertility gods of Baal and Asherah. These gods were often worshipped with orgies, which was totally against God's commands. Gideon did so at night, because he was scared of what the community would say and do, and he had good reason to be apprehensive, because when the people discovered that the idols had been destroyed, they demanded his death. Fortunately, his father spoke up for Gideon and said, If Baal and Asherah are gods, let them fight their own battles. In this way, the triple impotency of these false gods was revealed. Firstly, they couldn't protect the Jewish communities from their enemies. Secondly, they could not even protect their own idols from destruction. And thirdly, they could not put Gideon in his place. Idols are powerless to help us when we really need God. As you read in the passage of the Ten Commandments, God has directly stipulated that he will not tolerate any rivals to his claim on us. There were never to be any idols of people or wondrous creatures or ordinary animals for that matter. Anything which might become an object of veneration or worship. Such things were anathema to God. To be practical, if you have a statue or painting of any eastern deity in your home, yes, and this would include those little brass Buddha doorsteps, get rid of it. And by that I don't mean give it away or sell it, I mean destroy it. Such an action is biblical. In Acts 19 verse 19, we read how the newly converted folk who had been practicing magic publicly burnt their books, estimated by Luke to being about 50,000 silver coins in value, approximately 3 million rand in this week's precious metals markets. Furthermore, 
Depictions of God in any form whatsoever were totally forbidden. There were to be no paintings, no statues, no engravings, no reliefs of him. All were off limits. The reason for this command is simple. No human mind can stretch enough to depict God. Our wildest imaginations are too small to ever come close to what God is like. And so in any depiction, there would always be insufficiency. In fact, it would be a lie. Because God would not be like that. Hence, no one was permitted to attempt to depict him in any way. What we are commanded to do is to reserve and save all worship for only God and his eternal son, Christ Jesus. We may only bow down before God. The Bible tells us neither people nor angels are worthy of worship. In Acts chapter 10, Peter journeyed to the town of Joppa to visit the home of a God-fearing Roman centurion named Cornelius. When Cornelius greeted people, Peter, he wanted to bow down before Peter and worship him. But the disciple would not let him, saying, Don't, I'm only a man. Paul and Barnabas had a similar experience. The people of Lystra wanted to offer sacrifices to them after they had healed a crippled man in Acts chapter 14. In the closing chapter of the book of Revelation, John the Apostle was so overcome by the great things that he had seen that he tried to bow down before the angel that had led him through all that he had seen. But the angel stopped him saying, Do not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and all who keep the words of this book. That's in Revelation 22 verse 9. Of all that have trodden the earth, only Jesus is worthy of being worshipped. Because as Paul wrote in Galatians 1 verse 4, Jesus gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this evil age. Paul had come to realize the greatest treasure of all. The rabbi Jesus from Nazareth, that he had hated because he believed Jesus to be the worst kind of religious imposter, liar and con artist. That Jesus was in fact God in the human form of his son. For you and me, this may not seem to be a big deal. But for an ultra-conservative Pharisee like Paul, this was a shift in his mindset at a level that can only be understood as being the difference between being born and raised and living in a black room until suddenly in your late 20s you discover that there is something called light and for the first time you see the world around you. The world in which the earlier church was founded was one where many diverse religions operated and at the forefront was the belief in the many gods and goddesses that made up the Greco-Roman pantheon. It was the supporters of this false religion in Lystra that wanted to worship Paul as Hermes, who was the messenger of the pantheon, and Barnabas as the chief god Zeus, because they could see that the younger man, Paul, was obviously the older man's student and mouthpiece. This almost heretical act of worship worried Paul so greatly that he determined to make sure that future generations never got confused about how many gods there were and who was a true link to God. And so some years later, when he was now one of the most senior pastors in the Christian community, he wrote a letter to his young protege Timothy in the following words, There is one God, and there is one mediator between God and humanity, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all. That's in 1 Timothy 2 verse 5. This was the Jesus that Paul had come to understand as being the perfect mediator between God and himself. In fact, in any situation where a mediator is to act, all of us would choose to have our case argued and defended by an inner member of the opposing side's family. And the elder son and heir would be the best choice of all. In the heavenly court... There is no one else, not an angel or a prophet, who has the ear of the Father like his beloved Son, who is destined to reign over creation at his Father's side one day. He is the one who, in the last night of his earthly life, said the following to his eleven disciples, 
for, Jesus, for Judas had already left to betray Jesus to the authorities. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father unless they come to him through a relationship with me. John 14 verse 6. This was the Jesus that had invited all people who were struggling with the daily issues of life to come to me, all you that are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. That's from Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. This is the Jesus who alone is to be worshipped because he is worthy of all worship. When we do so, we become part of the glorious host in heaven who bow before him who is the Saviour of the world, the Lamb of God. At this point, we must become practical, admit there are many things that can inadvertently become idols. So what is the best course of action to avoid falling into the sin of becoming accidentally idolatrous? The answer is simple. We must deliberately choose to make the person of Jesus Christ central in our lives. We must crown him as our personal God and King placing him on the throne of our hearts. As we do so, we must ask that God's Holy Spirit reveal to us anything that might be threatening to become a challenge to Jesus in our lives, and to ask God to help us to reject any such prospective idol, and to put it in its rightful place in our lives with respect to him. Many years ago, a young brilliant violinist answered the call to become a missionary, in one of his last actions before leaving for his remote mission station, he gave his beloved violin away. One of his friends tried to talk him into taking it with him because he was going to a place where his music might be his only companion. I know, replied the new missionary. That is why I must give my violin away because if I take it with me, I fear I might come to depend on it more than I do on the Lord Jesus Christ. When we draw everything together, it is all about getting our priorities sorted out in our lives. God has declared his love for us in the wondrous gift of his Son, the Lord Jesus. And in return, he has called us to love him and to reserve all our homage, devotion and worship for him alone. Let us reject all rivals and love God above all else. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, please protect my heart from ever making anyone or anything more important in my life than you are. Amen. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you without blemish before the presence of his glory with rejoicing, to the only God, our Saviour, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, and now and forever. Amen.